So once in a while, you come across, I, is this, was this person in the church? I mean, you come across something somebody wrote or, or they said, and, and then you heard about it. And you, listen to this, listen to this. The human value is not the ultimate, but only the pen ultimate, which, by the way, means either the last or the one right before the last. Depends on it's up for argument. Penultimate is not the thing. So human value is either last or right before the last in value. The last is human. The highest value is God, the Father. He alone is the cause and the measure of all things. Cause and measure of all valuations. Cause and measure of all love. This was written by a man born in 1876, died in 1966. And how someone outside of God's church could come to this conclusion and actually do it the way he did it here, measure and, and, and value, I think he was either in the church or being called into it. His name was Carl Adam. I don't know if you've ever heard that name, but he got it. Human value is not the ultimate. Oh, but it is. You know where we got that? Go ahead. You can eat of that tree. You won't die. You'll be as God. That's when it started. And that deception and that distraction has been there ever since. And we see ourselves so important as to ignore God. Humans don't naturally recognize God. It's not natural. We can't do it. We might say it's wonderful that God has done all this, like the person looking at Mount Rushmore. Isn't that wonderful what nature can do? But, that's a joke, but, but we have very little that we've actually done and certainly nothing that is eternal. Nothing that we've done. He's the source of everything, including our very breath. That's reality. We don't control anything. We don't create anything. We don't design anything. Well, yeah, we do. Okay, so Henry Ford invented the first commercial process to make a vehicle. Where'd the metal come from? Where'd the laws that make it work come from? Where'd his mind come from? He didn't really invent it. We manipulate. We work with what's already designed and in place. We don't really control anything, including each other or ourselves. Our godly commission and our calling is, like Christ, to live and example, as Christ does and did, he's one with the Father. So when you example him, you're exampling the Father. Examples of God life. If someone were to look at you, they should be in me. They should be able to see God. Not that we are, but they should see God in us. And frankly, we actually should probably be basically invisible because they will be so amazed at what they see. That's where our Savior leads us. And we could call that living in the priority, the single most important thing. Oh, you made that up. Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Don't call me good. No one is good but God. And Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And the second commandment's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, which yourself is structured by God. So you love what God's doing, even when you're loving your neighbor, which is also made by God. In other words, the priority is God. It's not my stuff or my life or my things. I guess 
when you think it through, if and I have thought this through, if I were quadriplegic in hospice, barely able to think straight, I have hope. Not miss life. Well, that's just stupid. Well, okay, that's the way the world thinks. It's all vanity, right? Didn't we just read that? All right. Let's turn to Luke 5. This is something that Christ had happen. It's an account of something Christ did in choosing an apostle. We don't see it this way. Maybe now we will. We can learn to see. We can learn to see God as superior to ourself. Well, we know he's superior. No, actually see it. See reality. That would mean we aren't concerned primarily about what's going on around us. We understand what's really going on. Not the distraction Satan sets up. Not the way someone attacks us in traffic or the problems we have financially or morally or family-wise, but God first. We can learn to do that. God is superior in love. God is love. God is superior in divinely loving. He knows more about it. He is what it is. He is love. And he loves sinning humans. The ones we see in this society that we don't want to get along with, that don't want to get along with us. Forgive them as they as we forgive us as we forgive them who sin against us. See, this all starts to fit. He loves them because he made them just like he made us. Now, one, any human being recognizes that God is superior, actually recognizes that God is superior and that our ideas are not. God grants us something. And we draw near to him. Watch. Luke 5, verse 4. Luke 5, verse 4. Now, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Simon is a professional fisherman. His family and many depend on him and his expertise. Did I just say that right? This professional who many depend on for their life and his expertise in fishing, this professional fisherman Christ speaks to. He says to Simon, launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a catch. And the response? But Simon answered and said to him, Master. Now he's acknowledging that there's somebody who is more capable at life than him. We have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, because you're telling me to do this, I know it's not going to work, but I will let down the net. We trialed all we did. I know what I'm talking about. I'm a professional fisherman. People rely on my ability. We worked all night, no fish. But I see you're a good man, so I'll do it. And when they had done this, God took over. Because you know what? Simon was right. Humans couldn't catch any fish there. Not then. But God took over. You really want to listen to that? Our reasoning is worthless. They caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners on the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. This isn't possible, but it happened. Then Simon Peter saw it, and what happened? He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, this is an important inter interchange. He fell down. What that clearly means is he recognized the superior. He fell down. He recognized the superior. Another word for that is worship. 
when Christ got out of the boat in the, Gen in the Genesarenes, I can't say that word, I can never say that word, Genesarenes, the, the, the demons, the two demon-possessed men ran up to him and worshipped him. What? The two demons ran up to him and worshipped him. Demons worshipped him. Demons worship God. Why are they demons if they worship God? They recognize the superior. That's what that word means. Peter recognized the superior. He fell down. And his reaction was not, teach me what to do. His reaction wasn't, thank you for showing me who's superior. His reaction wasn't, now what are your, what are your plans for me? His reaction was, I am such an evil person. You should not be near me. It is in your best interest to be away from me because you should not be near evil. Yes or no? Isn't that what he said? Isn't that the lie Satan tells you? I have sinned so much, God can't forgive me. Not this time. Verse 8, verse 9, excuse me. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And also, so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't worry about anything. I'll take care of it. I'll no. He said, Don't be afraid. Why, where, did, where did we get that he was afraid? Where did we get that? Christ knew he was actually afraid because he couldn't control this. You hear that? He couldn't control this. Oh, we never do that. We never control our environment. We never disregard God as primary so we can control our environment. And but here, yes, we do. And here, God stepped in and said, you're not in control. And don't be afraid. Why? From now on, now on, you will catch men. This stops right here. Verse 11. So when they brought their boats to the land, they forsook all. They left their boats, their business, their investment, and their families for a time and followed him. If you would find life, if you would have life, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow after me. It means that's just that. Remember he sent out the 70? Don't take money. Don't take an extra tunic or cloak. Don't take food. Go. Makes no sense. You have to feed the army. Go. The rational approach that we see here is the truth. Christ showed Simon Peter. He was not actually in control no matter how much he knew about fishing, no matter how much he knew about life, no matter how much he knew about righteousness, he wasn't in control. And he had no idea why he was there. But he was instructed because he said, I shouldn't be near you. He saw himself, and Christ allowed him to see himself. That's part of repentance. We never stop repenting. Or, yeah, we could. Just say, I had enough of this. I'm just going to do it myself now. Very bad idea. That's where we blaspheme the Spirit. So our first point is that we see God as superior to ourself. And by self, that ought to be in quotation marks. The greatest quote I understand, I'm sure there are greater ones, but the one I understand to define self is, Father, please let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, your will be done. Not myself, not my wish, not my desire first. Your wish, your will. And they forsook all and they followed him. Let's turn over to Hebrews 10 now. Our second point. 
go to over to Hebrews 10, please. Our second point is, is pretty simple, too, in living in the priority. This is where we live all the time. We're living in this constant praise and prayer. You say, well, I can't pray all the time. Well, then you have a bad idea of what prayer is. I can't praise all the time. You have a good idea of, of how to function everything else but, but praising. Look, the first thing in life is God. Yes or no? The first thing in consciousness is God. Your breath is from God. Your creation is from God. Your purpose, your design is from God. You are for God. The church is for God. Yeah, but no yeah, but. The second point is to hold fast to God's superior hope. He gives us a truthful place to go. The truth. The vision of his kingdom and his righteousness, the vision that only his people understand. It's a superior hope. And here's something else bizarre about that. We are constantly confessing as if we've done something wrong. Oh, yes, we have. We're constantly confessing that we cannot bring this about, this hope that he's going to bring about in us we can't bring about, and we constantly confess that. Where's that in the Bible? Hebrews 10, verse 22. Hebrews 10, verse 22. This is about learning who God is, him learning about us, and us coming to see our future with him. Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near as if we're not near. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. That's a gift, too, from God. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience being washed away and our bodies washed with water. And verse 23. Let us hold fast. Do not let go. The confession of our hope. I admit I actually hope for the kingdom above everything. Seek you first the kingdom and his righteousness. Does this sound familiar? The confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. This is the person who doesn't lie. This is not the father of lies that manages our lives when we let him. This is not the murderer from the beginning. This is the creator. This is the truth the way, the life. And he said, you're going to the kingdom. We're going to be together. We will be family forever. Stop that stuff. Don't listen to that guy who told you you'll be like God. You won't until we work together. So we constantly hold fast. That's us. That's our part. Hold on. Don't let go. That means prayer, and it means study, it means fasting, it means, it means meditation. And by the way, it means, for some, not everybody learns this way, taking notes on your prayer, your study, your fasting, and your meditation. Because as, as amazing as it sounds, it is entirely possible to be in a good attitude and then have the world come at you. And the next time you go to pray, you forget, what was I doing? What was I talking about? What was I studying? What was all that that I really thought was so good? Huh? I don't know. I guess it's gone. Write it down. When you come back, you pick up where you left off then. Oh, I'm smarter than that. I'll remember. Okay. Good for you. Let's go back over to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. Take notes on my prayer. Taking notes in the sermon. Ephesians 2. We constantly hold fast to this confession of our hopeless ways. We have hopeless ways. I talked to someone this week, not in the church, talked to someone this week who was hopeless. It's really sad to find someone hopeless. They had no direction. Someone in their family had died, and they didn't know what to do about all of that, all of the things that happened after the death. 
It was so sad. No hope. Hopeless. Well, that's us. Without God's revelation, without his vision, without his joy, we're hopeless. And we confess that we're hopeless, that we need him. We confess that and compare his hope and his priority <laughs> to our man-made vain hope and priority. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you he made alive. No, oh, I thought already was alive. No, he made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. You, you, you were dying as far as he's concerned in the, in the Greek language, you were dead. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Those distracted ones, those vain people who believe they know better than God about what's really important. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of the flesh, the works, uh, the, uh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us while we were sinning, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Your names are written in heaven. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In other words, we're going to be examples to the rest of humanity. When they understand what was happening there for those thousands of years where we were left on our own. And find out we were never on our own. We were under the sway of the God of this world. Because whoever we yield ourselves slaves to obey, they are who we are slaves to. To Satan or to God. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, meaning you have to trust God to be graceful. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his worksmanship. Again, we don't get credit, he does. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should live and be in them. So the first two points. God needs to be seen as superior. See him as superior to ourself. And he will enable that. He will allow us. He will give us the strength through his dunamis, the power of everything, including creation, to see ourselves inferior to him, impotent, temporary, not philosophically, actually. And the second point is that we are to hold fast to God's superior hope, confessing that we cannot bring it about. And that's the truth. That's reality. We are unable to bring about God's design for his family, for his kingdom, and we have to confess that hope that he is able. And we do it because we're with him. We're in Christ. He's giving us that ability. Okay. This is the uncomfortable part, as if the rest of it wasn't. <laughs> so here's the third thing. We are what is in our heart. Luke 6. We are what is in our heart. No, I do what's in my heart. No, we are what's in our heart. Luke 6. But, you know, from my heart, I, I want to serve God, so that means I'm serving him. Is that so? We're very good at deceiving ourselves. Our heart does it. Above all things, the heart is deceptive. We can't even understand that. We are what's in our heart. Luke 6. Where are we here? Okay. Since God is love, 
that all good things proceed from him. In other words, he's giving up of himself for everything to exist, for everything to be good, or as he put it at creation, very good in your case. It's all coming from, he is love. It, everything comes from him. That's right. Frankly, everything comes from him. He allows things that are wrong. Four times. He hates that. But it's teaching us how dumb we are. How vain we are. How useless we are. Like Ecclesiastes says. Luke 6, verse 45. We are what's in our heart. Luke 6, 45. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. That doesn't come from humans. Remember Christ said, don't call me good. There's only one good, that's God. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. We are what's in our heart. We are what our heart is. David said, create in me a clean heart. He didn't say, make me over to have a clean heart. He didn't say, give me a clean heart. He didn't say, clean my heart. He said, create. In other words, just like creating a life. I know how hard this is to imagine, but there was a time when you didn't exist. You were created. There was a moment when you started. That's what that means. In the 51st Psalm, he's creating me a clean heart. Start one. It hasn't been here. You start one. God, please create in me a clean. And he says in another place, undivided heart. In other words, let me think about how good God is. Okay, now I've got other stuff to do. Or as I have been told, this is all good and fine on the Sabbath, but I have a job, so I have to think about that when I'm there. We do everything we do as to the Lord, or we're wasting our life. Yes or no? These are standards God says. You can get into the kingdom, be allowed into the kingdom. I want you in the kingdom, but it's a narrow road. It's not wide. It's not, I'll go over here for a while, I'll go over here to New Milford, and then I'll go over here now to Las Vegas, and then, you know, it's okay, I'll get to the kingdom. No, it's just really narrow, and few are there who find that way. And the way you find it is to be led on it and stay on it because you're being led, because God's superior. How do we do this? We're continually to recognize our dependence. Without God as our guiding priority, we'll just drift. We'll be dust and ashes. That's our state of being. That's us. We will pass. And you know, it won't take long, a decade, two, a hundred years. We won't be remembered. But I did great things. We're dust and ashes. We go, going is a very important thing. We go to God, we going to God at all times, denying self-guidance, self-importance, self-priority, and we follow him. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. This all fits. Second Peter 1. Second Peter, let's turn there. Second Peter 1, please. You know, one of the things they told us in these classes this last weekend was please bring a Bible to the lectern and don't tell, don't give a sermon from your computer. Now, why would they say that? It's because you can read the scriptures. Okay, 1 John 3, 4, John 3, 16. You've been through those, haven't you? So in love, they want us to allow you to turn to the verses. And guys who are in a hurry have to wait. <laughs> Time limit. You have to wait 
for us to get to it because you're the congregation of the mighty. Guess what? Mankind relies on you. They don't know it, you know. The church is the pillar and ground of truth, not, dis not distraction, not lies. The pillar and ground, the place of the truth, the pillar and the ground, the foundation of the truth is the church. You're it. You're the congregation of the mighty. Your names are written in heaven. Let's respect what God's doing for you and in you by going to him and praising him for it. 1 Peter 1, 2. How do we do this? 1 Peter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. There's a subject in itself. Be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His, as his divine power, this power of the universe and beyond, has given to us all things that, and this is in parenthesis, that to life and godliness. So all things to life and godliness, right? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us. Oh, we didn't find this ourselves. We didn't search it out. We didn't invent it. It's been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, the hope of reality that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. That's how we have the divine nature, is that we look at the hope and trust it. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, in other words, there's a part we have to play, add, and this is by yielding to God's will and design for you, add to your faith virtue. God will help you do that. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, God. There's a process to get to love, and God wants you to do it. But you have to focus on him, not yourself. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, we have to be yielding to him to be able to have these things happen. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. And by the way, staying self-guided and self-defined in our priorities is this, this short-sighted stuff. Our own priorities are short-sighted, blind priorities. Even to blindness, hello, it says that, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. God shows us himself and his ways. And he enables us to live in the real priority that he has given us to know. So we are to see God as superior to ourself. That's first. Second, hold fast to God's superior hope. This world doesn't give us any. And the third thing is that we are what's in our heart. We are what we are in our heart. Let's turn back to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, please. You could call it kingdom priority, that the first thing is the kingdom and his righteousness. That's a kingdom priority, not the bills, not being accepted in society, not being great in our own minds, but kingdom first. Hebrews 10 and verse 32. Hebrews 10, 32. But, in verse 32, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, wow, you got some light in you, you endured a great struggle with suffering. So guess what? What happened when you were waked up, wake, awoken, from blindness, there was a struggle that came on you because God allowed that. Partly while you were made a spectacle both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became com companions of those who were so treated. The world hates the church. If you actually explain it, they'll laugh at you, hold us in derision like they did Christ. We may 
we are allowed to live with God first. First, above everything else. His thoughts, his ways, him first. And since he is, by the way, have you thought about when he said to people, I am, and they fell down? Why would they do that? It's because I am means I am everything. Breath, law, structure, the creation, life, I am. And it came across through the Holy Spirit to even people who didn't have it, and they fell down. It's so powerful. He is, and we are of him. Whether our priorities admit it or not. Verse 35. Verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. There's a sequence here. For yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. And now the just shall live by faith, but anyone who draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Where'd that come from? That's a quote. Where'd it come from? It came from Habakkuk or Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. The Old Testament understood. There were those who understood. The prophets understood this. Don't draw back the kingdom, God's future, the reality of life is happening now, will come to this earth. Your kingdom, when it's on the earth, every, your will will be done. There are going to be humans here. They will do his will. Is that possible? Sure. They'll have his priorities. There won't be anybody there to stop them. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe in the saving of the soul. Now, now we have a new life, a new heart, a new being in us. And it's hidden with Christ in God. Living in the priority. 